So like, um, I'm going to now basically point out that in Passover, or Pesach, as we Jewish people actually call it, we call it Pesach, we read from the Haggadah, which is supposed to be the journey of Moshe Rabbeinu, that means Moses our, our, Moses, our teacher, Moshe Rabbeinu. He leads us through the desert, away from Mitzrayim, or Egypt, which is not a slur against the Jew. It was sorry, which is not a slur against the Egyptian people. It's reminiscent of the slavery in Egypt. It might be interesting to point out that the Hebrew word for Mitzrayim is oh, sorry. The Hebrew, yeah, the exactly the Hebrew word for Egypt is Mitzrayim, which refers to prison. So it's really not as much that the story is about Egypt. It's about the Pharaoh's system, Pharaoh or Pyro. Now, Pyro. Yeah, it depends on how you pronounce it, but that's basically what it is. And if you read a truly orthodox Haggadah, Moses is nowhere to be mentioned. There are a lot of symbolic reasons for this, and this is because Moshe Rabbeinu is the one leading you out of Egypt. It happens every year. Now, coming from a more mystical point of view myself, I don't exactly come from an academic point of view, and I don't exactly come from a theological point of view. I come from a mystical point of view. That's only me personally. I don't speak for all Jewish people, and I'm not exactly speaking for the Buddhist movement when I say that. However, there are some times when the more mystical thoughts will intertwine with exclusively Buddhist. Now, remember, Buddhism is a political construct. It is not exactly a religious thing. Um, the Buddhist movement is a political movement for the collective rights of the Jewish people. This is why, however, a Bundist would particularly look at Pesach as particularly significant. So there's the theme of the four sons in the Haggadah. The first son is the righteous son. The second son is the wicked son. The third son is the simpleton. And then there's that fourth son, the one who does not know how to ask a question. So, there is... I'm going to provide a Bundist spin on this. And I hope everybody appreciates it. It's it's this, this just this was all me that did this, by the way, and this is truly how I see it. I hope the Bundist movement would uh, appreciate this as a whole. None of you expected I was going to do this, but I'm doing it anyway. Ha! So the the first son, the first son is the Bundist. Then you have the second son. Uh, which is always the self-hating Jew. Typically a Bolshevik Marxist sort of figure. That's usually what it amounts to, typically, within Jewish circles. It's almost like default. Of course, the third son is actually the Zionist. Yeah, the simpleton is the Zionist. The Zionist doesn't even get to be the wicked son. The Zionist is simple-minded, not not smart, therefore almost like the antithesis of being Jewish, and a simpleton, simple-minded, Zionist. That fourth son, you know, the one that doesn't know how to ask a question, there's only, there. well, the two words, Ted Rubenstein. Putting all jokes aside now, Dr. Weisfeld, as I understand it, he will be having Pesach with the Samaritan Palestinians. I will now turn you to a clip from Press TV. And it involves, uh, I mean, this clip 
In fact, all clips that I'm gonna, all news clips I will show you in this presentation, came out yesterday. It was Shabbos, so I hadn't seen them. Right before Shabbos, I knew about the. Um, I did know that there was a march, and I heard that our violence was possibly erupting, or that it wasn't. I did say a prayer. I was very worried. First thing I did was I. When the Shabbos was over, I looked into this. I got immediate updates from Uri as he's reformed, so he. I mean, he, he respects the Shabbos, but being that he's reformed Jewish, he doesn't necessarily find the Orthodox way of doing it obligatory. Um, he also will often do a lot of stuff for us during Shabbos because of that, as we have an Orthodox policy, and we do take Judaism seriously. But we don't discriminate against the reform, the conservative or the reconstructionist. In fact, one of our main members is reconstructionist, another is conservative. Or he just happens to be reform. Well, he gave me the full rundown on everything. And what really makes me angry about this is that what has happened to Gaza recently with the at least 16 murdered I believe it was at least uh, 16 well no it was at least 16 but many are saving 17 it's it's bad and there's more than 1,400 injured the goal that the Zionist state has to do this during Pesach is insulting. You see, the state of Israel really has no right to exist. It's almost as if its entire function is to set the Jewish people up. If there is a second Holocaust coming, as every a lot of paranoid Jewish people are, there's a lot of Jewish paranoids out there that are obsessed with this idea of an upcoming Holocaust coming, if there would be, it will come because of the Zionist state, maybe even by the Zionist state with the way that they treat the ultra-Orthodox. Meanwhile, Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas has declared Saturday a day of national mourning after those 17 Gazans were killed by Israeli forces on Friday during the peaceful protests in the besieged enclave. Abbas also called on the United Nations to protect defenseless Palestinians. Our Ramallah correspondent, Mona Kandil, brings us more. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas says Israel is fully responsible for the death of Palestinians during peaceful protests on land day in the Gaza Strip. In a televised speech, Abbas asked the United Nations to immediately work towards providing protection for the defenseless Palestinians and called on the international community to intervene. I express my pride in the sacrifice of the Palestinian people today. I place the responsibility for the death of the martyrs in Gaza and Israel. The occupation army attacked nonviolent demonstrators who went out to mark land day and to emphasize that they adhere to the right to self-determination. I instructed our envoy to the UN to demand international protection for the Palestinian people from the Security Council and the UN. Abbas also declared Saturday a day of national mourning in honor of the Palestinians who were killed by Israeli forces during the Great Return March that was held along the so-called buffer zone on land day. Palestinian Prime Minister Rami Hamdallah also said Israel should be held accountable for what he described as a premeditated murder of Palestinians in Gaza. A general strike across the occupied West Bank was also held following calls by Palestinian Authority and national factions. The killing of Palestinians by Israeli forces, those people were peacefully protesting Israeli occupation policies and demanding their right of return. The Israeli regime deployed the snipers at the borders with Gaza to kill people in cold blood. This is why today is a gloomy and sad day across the occupied territories. We are observing a day of mourning and general strike to pay tribute to the victims and we insist that those Israeli criminals and the regime must be held accountable. Meanwhile, the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez called for an independent and transparent investigation into the deaths and injuries in Gaza on Friday. 
His call came as the UN Security Council heard fears of a further escalation in the Gaza Strip during emergency talks. The council, however, failed to publicly condemn Israel's use of fatal force against civilians in Gaza. Many experts believe that the high number of casualties on land day proves that people will always stand in defiance of Israel's occupation. Mona Kandil for Press TV, Occupy Dramallah. Let's go over to London and join my peace advocate and political commentator, Mr. James Thring. Thanks so much for being with us. Uh, well, yesterday you saw what was a violent, uh, very violent day for Palestinians um, with their peaceful protest. Why don't we hear the kind of outrage that we should be hearing when we have 17 people, innocent people being killed, over 1,400 people being injured should be the top story on all news channels all over the world and should actually everyone be outraged at the loss of innocent life. What is it going to take for us to see this true reflection of the reality taking place there? Well, I, 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 uh, it would really mean a, a change of the way that the media in the West is controlled by friends of Israel. Um, but I have to say that it's beginning to happen because unusually the BBC Radio 4 this morning had an interview with uh, Mark Regev, the uh, ambassador to the UK, uh, in which it made quite a few challenging remarks. Uh, it started off by saying that these people were only conducting um, an innocent protest, uh, to which he said, oh no. Uh, they are trying to provoke violence. Uh, then the BBC said, uh, your troops fired on children. Now, the BBC doesn't usually uh, uh, allege any crimes against the, uh, the, the Israelis, but this is a beginning of it. Uh, Mark Regev then said, oh, um, they were trying to tear down the fence. And luckily, the BBC, brighter than usual, said, but it was an electric fence. How could children tear down an electric fence? Hmm. And uh, Mark Regev has difficulty there. He said he moves on to, oh, uh, Hamas rules Gaza with an iron fist, and uh, they force people into uh, doing this kind of thing, which of course is complete rubbish because it's a national day and everyone feels, everyone in Gaza must feel very violent about the way they're being treated. Uh, starved of water and food and communications with the outside world. So you think uh, that they're beginning, uh, there's the beginning of a transition um, in the West. You feel that more information is getting out, more accurate information reflecting the reality is actually getting out more and more to the people? Well, I can't generalize, but this was certainly a surprise this morning uh, from the BBC, which normally probably wouldn't even report this kind of uh, mass murder. But today they gave it about uh, 15 minutes. The only thing they didn't do was when um, uh, Regev said, um, oh, there's no reason for this violence. Uh, the BBC didn't say, well, of course there's a reason for it. Uh, the, these people were trying to get uh, to see their, ha their homes uh, across the border. And of course, they are living in a blockaded country, blockaded by the Israelis, uh, and, and and starved, as I said, of water and everything else. They didn't they didn't say that. Unfortunately. Well, hopefully so we we'll, hopefully we'll reach the point very soon uh, that they will get to that point and and say uh, the whole yes. truth. Thank you so much for being with us out of London, Mr. James Thring, peace advocate and a political commentator. You know what's really messed up? This this is what's really messed up. Take, take a look at this. Just take a look at this. Uh, I want to say that... First and foremost, I want to say that I'm very, very grateful to uh, the station's Press TV, which is run by Iran's uh, grants. You know, it's, it's Iran World News. Just as the BBC is British World News, there's Iran World News, which is Press TV. Russian World News which is, uh, of course, RT, meaning Russia Today. Then there's the Qatar's World News, which is Al Jazeera. I'd like to say that 
I would like to thank those three stations. I'd like to thank the three great world news media outlets that help to combat lies, pretty much. I'd like to thank Press TV, RT, and Al Jazeera. Now, clearly, Al Jazeera will clash against the two others. I tend to side more with the viewpoint of RT and Press TV, way more than I do Al Jazeera. However, Al Jazeera will also cover certain things that you won't see from RT or Press TV. It's important to have different outlooks, by the way, and to critically think about all from all angles. Like, you want to get into the urban ghettos of the United States of America, Al Jazeera is one of the best on that issue. I was enraged when Al Jazeera America didn't go as far as they could, and I personally blame Glenn Beck and Alex Jones for that, by the way. I'm not going to get too much into that, though. So you look at this picture. This was saved by RT. Because the IDF bragged about what they did. And then they removed the, what, what, what they boasted about. Fortunately, um, it's been archived. Freedom of the press, baby. RT archived it. Now you you want to know why people hate RT? It's not that people hate RT. Americanism hates RT because Americanism loves Zionism and Zionism loves Americanism. Bibi Netanyahu and uh, Mr. Trumping justice so that justice will be trumped by Trump himself. So Donald Trump and Benjamin Netanyahu, they're like birds of a feather. You hear all this stuff about, ooh, Putin. And Trump, there is no such Russian gate. There is an Israel gate, though, isn't there? There is such an Israel gate. APAC, okay? American Israel Public Affairs Committee, right? It's whatever. Which is not a Jewish lobby, by the way. That's an evangelical Christian lobby, if you really want to get into that. Yeah, once again, Zionism is like the very antithesis of Judaism. Always. So, you can see this picture right here. Yeah. Now, here's a, a very particular thing written on here. Yesterday we saw 30,000 people. We arrived prepared and with precise reinforcement. Nothing was carried out uncontrolled. Everything was accurate and measured. And we know where every bull bullet landed. Let me repeat that. We know where every bullet landed. They boasted about this in their hubris, and then they removed it. But thanks to the fact that Russia has the freest press in the world, and that the best world news comes from Russia, not saying Russia's perfect, because if you're looking for a perfect country, you're, an uto you're a utopian and you live in a fantasy world. But... If you want to know who today's Queen of Exiles is, do you want to know what Give Me Your Poor, Give Me Your Remain Tired? It's not the United States. That's Russia, you're thinking. Russia believes in a free press. When, when people truly protest against Putin, or any part of the government, Russian media covers it. In America, we make it about Democrats and Republicans, but they never truly fully covered the full extent of Occupy Wall Street when it happened. They don't cover the Jewish people protesting the state of Israel because American media is one of the worst medias of all time. America actually has the worst media in the world. Most people don't know that. Um, by most people, I don't mean most people, I mean most Americans don't know that. But most people do if they're not American. So, um, yes, I, I am... When I say most people, I, I don't really mean most people. I mean the Americans and those who um, worship the tyranny of America. Which, by the way, there's no difference between the tyranny of America and the tyranny of the United States. Okay, if you want to get technical, Israel has a worse military than America. And America has a very bad military, but I would say Israel has a worse, a much worse military. And I would say that America's intelligence is a lot more dirty than Israel's intelligence. It's not that one is really worse than the other. They're very much the same when you get down to it. All right, so, yeah, remember that. Nothing was carried out uncontrolled. Everything was accurate and measured. And we know where every bullet landed. Incredible. 
At least 17 Palestinians have been killed and over a thousand injured in clashes with Israeli soldiers along the Gaza border. That's according to the UN's permanent observer for Palestine, the UN Secretary General calling for an independent investigation into the deaths. Earlier, the Israeli army used live bullets, tear gas and drones against Gaza demonstrators. The annual March of Return is a demonstration denouncing Israeli occupation. Thousands of Palestinians have pitched tents across five locations where they're expected to stay for six weeks. In response, IDF soldiers have stationed more than 100 snipers overlooking the area. Local journalist Hind Kudari has been following the clashes along the Gaza border. We're only 100 meters away from the fence. As you see, we can see the Israeli army snipers, we can see the Israeli army soldiers uh, in the jeeps and trying to target all the protesters that are being very close to the fence by live ammunition, rubber bullets and the tear gas canisters. Uh, for they are using uh, new, updated and developed weapons. As you see, this is the tear gas by the drone, uh, by the Israeli army. Uh, they throw, the, they are using the drone to throw the tear gas canisters on the protesters. And this is like the 10th time they're using it since the beginning of the day. Here, here's a live injury uh, just right now from the tear gas canisters that were thrown on the protesters just right now. And as you see, everyone is trying to take this injury uh, to the ambulance to go to the hospital directly. The Palestinians are going to stay here for more than 45 days until the 15th of May because uh, they believe that they have the retire they have the right to return to their land they have the right to stay here and they won't go they won't go home until they go back to their uh, origins to their homeland and to their towns the west bank city of ramallah is also witnessing a violent standoff with idf soldiers shooting at palestinian stone throwers and palestinian president mahmoud abbas has declared saturday a national day of mourning Israel earlier blamed what it called violent riots on the Palestinian political movement Hamas. The country's army said that it would respond to any threat to Israeli sovereignty as well as to damage to the security fence. <laughs> Ahead of the mass protests, a Palestinian farmer was killed by an Israeli tank shell. His relatives say he was harvesting parsley one kilometer from the Israeli border before dawn. The thousands marched on the streets of Gaza as his body was being carried. The Israeli military says it was aware of the reports but claimed the tank fire was directed towards people who approached the fence and were acting suspiciously. Jamal Juma from the anti-wall and settlements movement thinks Israel's heavy-handed response to the Palestinian demonstrations is disproportionate. It is a very strong message to the international community. This uh, march and this gathering, and, uh, the return march is a peaceful march. The Israelis are pushing a lot of military on, the, on that, that areas and they, are, and they are shooting at the people. So the one who's using the, the, the violence the immense, the, and the immense power is the Israeli military. They don't care about the Palestinians' life. They don't see the Palestinians. That, and they are sure that they are, every crime that they are doing, they are escaping with it because they are immune by this international system, particularly the United States and the, and the, Arab, the European countries that they are silenced there and the Arab countries that do normalization with Israel and do allies with Israel now. I got to tell you, like, really, it, it is so hard for me to trust in nonviolence. Because largely the world does does not care. Those that care um, are usually people who can do nothing about it anyway. And those that could do something about it, they're too scared to because they're cowardly. Not because they could do something about it. If enough people got together, we could all do something about this. But people are cowardly. Yet here we got Jewish people like me, far from being alone, who do care and do try to do something about it. And yet people say there's no Jewish people out crying against this. That's a lie. Again, that's a lie. 
Um, it's, it's whatever. I think it comes down to the part where there are several layers of anti-Semitism. One is it's Judophobia and Islamophobia. Another is is that it's an anti-Middle Eastern racism. So no matter how you... Which would mean that, of course, nobody cares about Palestine because they're anti-Semitic. Of course, nobody cares that Jewish people are opposing Zionism. And now we've got some of us, a lot of us, and more and more of us. And then soon you'll have probably all of us so terrified of what Israel does that we'll be all opposing it. And nobody may care at that point either because, well, they're just dirty Jews doing it. Isn't that right? It's, it's anti-Semitism. The hatred towards Palestinians, whether Jewish, Christian, or Muslim, uh, that's anti-Semitism. Because it's anti-Middle Eastern, therefore anti-Semitism. Um, hatred towards Islam is anti-Semitism. Hatred towards Judaism is anti-Semitism. So if you have a hatred towards the traditions of Islam or the traditions of Judaism, you're anti-Semitic. And if you hate the Middle East, you're anti-Semitic. And if you support Zionism, you are anti-Semitic. Period. It was supposed to be a peaceful day, but as unarmed protesters marched towards the border fence, Israeli soldiers opened fire. Sharpshooters were deployed, but Palestinians, frustrated by the endless siege they live under, were undeterred. Israeli commanders say they issued warnings against approaching the border fence. We will never shoot one bullet against anyone who stays away from the security wall. We have warned during the last few days that everyone who tries to violate the Israeli sovereignty or to infiltrate the Israeli territories will put himself and his life in danger. But for besieged Palestinians, demonstrating next to the border is about the only visible means available for the world not to forget their plight. We live under immense pressure. That is why the people explode. The blockade and the siege led to the explosion. We either choose to live properly or to die. We have no space. We have no alternatives but to explode. We have nothing except the oxygen in the air. Land Day is considered the first Palestinian popular uprising. For the past 42 years, Palestinians have been commemorating this day. But this year, after Trump's declaration over Jerusalem, it has taken greater significance. It all started here in northern Israel after thousands of hectares of land were confiscated from Palestinians back in 1976. Six Palestinians were killed then. Yara Mahamid says nothing has changed since. Palestinian land is still being taken away now more than ever. We came to commemorate this day because we have to confront the state. It's important to remember our martyrs, and it's important to save our ownership of the land. I personally think we should resist until our last breath. We shouldn't negotiate anymore. We shouldn't give up our rights. We need to find new ways. Many of the people living in Gaza today are refugees, and they're demanding their right to return home. Several tents have been erected a little further away from the border fence for what is being called the Great March of Return. People are vowing to stay here until May 15th. By then, the U.S. is due to have moved its embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Funerals will be held in Gaza today for the 17 who were killed uh, during the confrontations with the Israeli army on Friday. Now, uh, there is a lot of anger among Palestinians, not only in Gaza, but also in the occupied West Bank, and also among those who are living within the borders of Israel. Uh, Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas yesterday uh, has made a very short but quite a stern statement. He called for an investigation into what happened, and he actually called for international protection of uh, for Palestinians. Now we know also that Kuwait had asked for an emergency meeting at the Security Council and that the, he the um, head of the Security Council, uh, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, has asked for an investigation. Now the Israeli army says that it only shot at the protesters because they were hurling either pr uh, petrol bombs or some of them were armed. Uh, so far the Israeli army says also that it had been warning uh, protesters not to get close to the border fence. Uh, certainly the army was on edge because throughout the week and the days leading uh, to Friday,
they, uh, there had been several breaches of that fence with people actually from Gaza uh, making their way into uh, Israel. Now, protesters say that they will continue, they will go back to the fence today and in the coming days, and certainly those who are staying in those tents that are erected all along the border, well, they say that they will stay there until May 15th. Now, May 15th is a day that Palestinians refer to as Nakba, which means catastrophe. It's also the day where the state of Israel was created. Uh, so certainly one does expect a lot of tension continuing all along this border here behind me. So, even though this is being done on Pesach and that it is being done in the name of the Jewish people, which is the most outrageous thing, we have to not lose ourselves in this process. And, um, let's see, uh, well, Dr. Weisfeld is with the Samaritan Palestinians making meaning of his life, and... For the sake of the Jewish people and the Palestinian people, may we say, may, may we see an end to the existence of the Zionist apartheid state that dares use the collective name of Israel. Um, Pesach is a time of liberation. May it be for the Palestinians as well as the Jewish people. This meeting was hastily convened on an official UN holiday. It was called for by the Arab member of the Security Council, Kuwait, because its ambassador told me of the scale of the bloodshed. Uh, this is a violation of the international humanitarian law. As occupying power, also they are violating their uh, uh, obligations in accordance to uh, Geneva Convention. What should the council do now? We will ask the council to take action. Originally, this was supposed to be a closed meeting. Behind the scenes, the U.S. was blocking a council statement condemning Israel, and so Kuwait threatened to call an open meeting. The U.S., being represented by a mid-level diplomat rather than its ambassador, Nikki Haley, didn't back down. We urge those involved to take steps to lower tensions and reduce the risk of new clashes. Bad actors who use protests as a cover to incite violence, endanger innocent lives. The Palestinian ambassador was very clear about his government's view of what happened on the Gaza border. Those who brought the violence and the killing are the Israeli armed forces, our people in the Gaza Strip, raising not a banner of uh, faction, but the Palestinian flag demonstrated peacefully, 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 and they were attacked by the Israeli armed forces. It's a massacre by them. The UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has issued a statement calling for a transparent and independent investigation into what happened on the Gaza border. The UN Security Council, however, can't even agree a statement with the US, as it's done so many times before, taking one side, that of Israel. James Bayes, Al Jazeera, of the United Nations.